I'm Roy Lee Lindsay with the North Carolina Pork Council, and I want everyone to remember, bacon makes everything better. Welcome to This Week in College Football with David Glenn, brought to you by the North Carolina Port Council. Thank you so much for joining us for another week here on the show. I'm Chris Edwards. Great to be back with DG for year two on our rapidly growing North Carolina Sports Network. On our weekly show here in 2024, DG and I are going to mostly look ahead to the upcoming week's college football action, but we'll also discuss college football's biggest headlines, take a quick glance back at some of the action from last week with DG's expert analysis, and look at the biggest games and developments from the previous week's schedule. DG, now in his 38th year covering college football, both here in North Carolina and around the Atlantic Coast Conference. DG, always good to be with you, my friend. Chris, it's always great to be with you, my friend. I'm looking forward to chatting again this week. There's a lot to discuss. Well, let's get right to it. Of course, we will get to all of the 3-0 starts in the ACC and locally, including Duke and North Carolina. The Blue Devils and Tar Heels are two of seven ACC teams that remain unbeaten so far this year. A lot of headlines surrounding the quarterback position here in our state as well. But first, let's look ahead to this week's action. Here in week four, there are some very important storylines involving some in-state teams. So let's get to those right away. This segment brought to you by our great friends at Atlantic Tire and Service, where DG and his family take all of their vehicles for routine maintenance, service needs, and world-class selection of new tires. That's Atlantic Tire and Service with more than 25 years serving our North Carolina communities. They've grown to six, six triangle area locations, two in Cary, one in Durham, and one in Wake Forest. You can learn more at AtlanticTireOnline.com. Okay, DG, game one, NC State. They're two and one off that win over Louisiana Tech last week. They're at one and one Clemson this week. Tigers a 20-point favorite, and the Wolfpack a new quarterback this week as well. Yeah, Chris, if you and I were asked to tap into the evil genius side of our personalities and come up with the most difficult challenge for an ACC football player, our answer might be the following. Asking a true freshman, specifically at the quarterback position, to make his first career start at the college level on the road against a nationally ranked opponent that happens to be hosting the game at Death Valley, which is one of the most difficult environments in all of college football. Oh, by the way, let's put the game on national television on Saturday afternoon just to maximize the pressure and the scrutiny on the young man. Sure enough, those are exactly the circumstances this week for the Wolfpack's first-year quarterback, C.J. Bailey, who is an impressive physical specimen at six foot six and 190 pounds, but who, in an ideal set of circumstances, probably would have redshirted this year behind the Coastal Carolina transfer, Grayson McCall. Obviously, McCall, who missed the final six games of last season at Coastal Carolina with a concussion, was injured in the Wolfpack's closer than expected 30-20 to win in comeback fashion over Louisiana Tech last week. And it's not clear right now when McCall is going to be ready to play again for the Pack. Last week, C.J. Bailey was inserted for the final two first-half possessions against Louisiana Tech, and he had a really rough start. Three and out on the first possession, and then an interception that he threw on the second possession that led to a field goal for Louisiana Tech. The Wolfpack, remember, actually trailed the Bulldogs 17-6 to at the half, but the intermission at least allowed the Wolfpack coaches and the young player, C.J. Bailey, to process what was going on and to prepare him to be the guy in the second half. To that entire group's credit, they made the most of a very difficult situation. And on the Wolfpack's four offensive possessions in the second half, they went touchdown, field goal, touchdown, and then run out the clock to preserve the victory, which again ended 30-20 to 20 in favor of the Pack. On that first touchdown drive, Bailey hit wide out to Kari Collins twice, 
wide out Wesley Grimes twice, wide out Casey Concepcion twice, and also Jordan Waters out of the backfield one time. On the second TD drive, he also hit wide out Noah Rogers, tight end Justin Joe Lee for long gains. So Bailey really spread the ball around in impressive fashion, albeit against an outmatched opponent. For the game, Bailey ended up 13 for 20 for 156 yards and one interception statistically. But most importantly, he gained that experience while leading a comeback win in a fairly stressful situation as the Carter-Finley faithful were getting a little nervous as they did earlier this year against Western Carolina. Now, obviously, Clemson at Death Valley this week presents an entirely different animal. In the last 20 years of this rivalry, it's been Clemson with 16 wins, NC State with three wins, and then, of course, COVID interrupted everything in 2020, although the Wolfpack have won two of the last three in this series. The Tigers have one of the best defenses in the entire ACC, and they're coming off an open week after that 66-20 to demolition of App State. It would be a shock to me if the Wolfpack came away with an upset on Saturday afternoon. Just remember this about C.J. Bailey in the longer run. He was a three-time first-team All-State player and a two-time state champion in the state of Florida while leading a small private school named Chaminade Madonna Prep in Hollywood, Florida, where I actually lived for a while. He was not considered an elite recruit, mainly because he played in Florida's small school classification, but he played so well as a senior in high school that the Miami Hurricanes right down the road did come calling to him with a late scholarship offer from Mario Cristobal. All right, game two, DG, another unbeaten team, the North Carolina Tar Heels, 3-0. They're at home this week against James Madison. ACC Network has the game, the Tar Heels opening as a 10-point favorite. Yeah, the Tar Heels are in one of these classic good news, bad news situations in my eyes. The good news is, under some very difficult circumstances, including injuries and subpar play and unpredictable chaos at the quarterback position, they have figured out a way to beat Minnesota of the Big Ten on the road, then Charlotte and NC Central at Keenan Stadium. The defense and the special teams have been very good overall, and the offense has been, we'll say, good enough. So against James Madison this week, the Heels have a legit chance to start 4-0, before their ACC schedule begins. And, of course, it doesn't get any better than 4-0, even if you might not like the beauty of those pictures on the scorecards, as we said last week. The bad news, of course, includes the fact that at the most important position on the field, the Tar Heels have lost their starter, Max Johnson, for the entire season because of that broken leg he suffered at Minnesota. As we outlined in great detail here on this show and also at our website, ncsportsnetwork.com, Carolina's backup quarterback, Connor Harrell, has just never shown the ability to run a functional passing attack at the college level. And we got some pushback on that from some Carolina fans who thought he should have been starting way back at the beginning of preseason practice in August. We'll hesitate to say, I told you so, but that West Virginia bowl game debacle was real. And it's just fair to say at this point in the young man's career, he has not yet shown the ability to run a functional passing attack, even NC Central, an FCS opponent, was able to expose that this past Saturday. Carolina actually was stuck in a 17-10 game against Central into the fourth quarter, and it was up to the Heels' third-string quarterback, Jacoby Criswell, a guy who hasn't taken many meaningful snaps in his entire five-year college career to bail the Tar Heels out against the Eagles. To his credit, Chriswell looked confident at times in the passing game, although obviously Carolina rode their star running back, Omarion Hampton, 25 carries, 210 yards, three touchdowns on the ground, all the way to that victory. Although after Carolina, by the way, did nothing with Harrell at the controls against Central, Chriswell led three straight first-half scoring drives, mostly by complementing Hampton's running with short passes, to either star tight end Bryson Nesbitt or his wideouts, including this week's featured guest on the David Glenn Show, J.J. Jones, the senior for Carolina. In the second half, Harold did come back in for one early possession. That resulted in another punt. And then Chriswell led three touchdown drives in the fourth quarter, 
as the Tar Heels pulled away from NC Central. Importantly, Chris Well hit downfield passes, unlike what Harrell was able to do for the most part uh, in his appearances so far this season. Chris Well hit Christian Hamilton down the field. He hit both of his tight ends, Bryson Nesbitt and John Copenhaver, downfield. Although even during the Heels' fourth quarter flurry, it was much more of their running game, which probably almost certainly will not be able to dominate ACC opponents the way they were able to dominate North Carolina Central. James Madison, final note on this one, likely will be a much tougher test for the Tar Heels this week. The Dukes are 2-0, and and they're playing really good on the defensive side of the ball so far this season. One of their best offensive players at JMU, running back George Petway, is actually a UNC transfer in his first season at JMU. So a lot of those Tar Heel defenders will be very familiar with a guy that they pra- they tackled in practice uh, as recently as last year. It's probably going to be up to, again, UNC's defense and special teams to carry the day one more time as the Tar Heels try to find themselves on offense, either with Chris Well again or Harrell again or both. They even have a fourth stringer is true freshman Michael, might as well learn his name just in case, right? Michael Merdinger is a first-year guy from the state of Florida who is obviously very green. C.J. Bailey, true freshman starting at NC State. Who knows if that'll happen at Carolina at any point this season. But that group of players for the Tar Heels in the QB room is obviously key to the remainder of this campaign. And it's not yet clear if the Heels have any QB on that entire roster who's capable of leading them to a quality record in ACC competition eight games later this year, even if they end up with a 4-0 mark here in non-conference play. All right, we talked a lot about NC Central a moment ago. The Eagles at home this week. They're 1-2 and two against their big rival, North Carolina a and 7 o'clock game. This is nationally televised on ESPNU. And our old North State tailgate and traveling sports circus will be there for the annual Aggie Eagle Classic at O'Kelly Riddick Stadium this weekend, the Aggies and the Eagles. Yeah, Chris, I'm glad we're able to highlight this one. I have been covering the Aggie Eagle Classic since the end of the 1980s. So that's three plus decades now, including on various incarnations of our tailgate tour. As you just mentioned, we're excited to be there at O'Kelly Riddick Stadium in Durham. We'll be there prior to kickoff, 5 to 7 p.m. on Saturday in the hours leading up to the start of that game between the Aggies and the Eagles. This is one of the great historical rivalries in our state. These are the two largest HBCUs in North Carolina. They've been playing each other in football for seriously more than 100 years now, dating back to 1922. And the tailgating experience, for those who haven't been there outside of this matchup, offers a lot of amazing food, some great music, and a lot of wonderful fans that we like to revisit each year. Both schools, by the way, also have great bands, great cheerleaders, great dance teams. They add to the pageantry of it all as well. And we, of course, will be there once again this year with our tents, our prizes, our giveaways, our football toss game, plus some coupons and some other goodies uh, from our friends at Moe's Original Barbecue, our newest partner here on the North Carolina Sports Network. Moe's Original Barbecue, Chris, has about 50 nationwide locations, 5 0 including nine here in the Carolinas. There's one in Durham. Those folks are going to help us with the game on Saturday. One in Wilmington. Shout out to our friend Robert Ray down by the beach. One in Hendersonville and two in the greater Asheville area. Folks can learn more about Moe's at moesoriginalbbq.com. That's moesoriginalbbq.com. Now back to the game. Although North Carolina A&T has had the advantage in this gridiron rivalry Historically speaking, under head coach Trey Oliver, who's a former NC Central player and star player, the North Carolina Central Eagles have managed to swing the pendulum back to their advantage in recent years. After the Aggies won seven of 10 head-to-head matchups from, from 2011 through 2021, the Eagles have captured the last two games in this series, including last year in Greensboro on a and home field and the previous year in Charlotte when these two got together in the Queen City. Now the game is back on the Eagles' home field in Durham, where they'll try to make it three in a row. They haven't won there against the Aggies in quite a while. 
This time, though, everybody needs to remember Central is going to have to try to do it without their stu- superstar quarterback, Davius Richard. He was one of the best players in North Carolina Central football history. We got to enjoy him in recent years. He was a senior a year ago. He was an FCS All-American for Central. He was a two-time MEAC Offensive Player of the Year. NC Central's main man this time offensively is probably an all MEAC running back. His name's Jamari Taylor. He's a redshirt junior from uh, West Mecklenburg High School in Charlotte. On the Aggie side, the top dog so far has been running back Wesley Graves, who went over 100 yards in A&T's recent victory over Winston-Salem State. Neither of these offenses looks polished just yet, so it's going to be up to the defenses and the running games and special teams most likely to tilt the scales. By the way, for anybody who wants to visit with us, maybe throw some footballs or just pick up some coupons for free sandwiches from our friends at Moe's Original Barbecue, we will be in the track and field facility, which is immediately next to O'Kelly Riddick Stadium, where the game is being played, in those two hours leading up to the Aggie Eagle Classic kickoff. So we hope you'll come and visit us on your way into the stadium this weekend. All right, as we wrap up this opening segment, DG, maybe give us a few other games involving our in-state teams that are worth more of a maybe a brief mention going into this week. Yeah, quick hitters. App State is 2-1. and one. They had that nice win at ECU last week. Uh, they had that ugly loss at Clemson. But this is the start of Sunbelt Conference play for the Mountaineers. And whereas I don't see another FBS team in our state that has a legitimate chance to compete, For their conference championship, or let's just say a trip to their conference championship game, the Mountaineers do have a chance under Coach Sean Clark of making what would be their third trip in the last four years to the Sun Belt Conference Championship game. But you need to get a win against South Alabama to get off on the right foot during your conference schedule. That game uh, at the Rock in Boone, I like the Mountaineers' chances. That, by the way, is a Thursday night national TV window. From our friends, for our friends in Boone. So watch the game on ESPN Thursday night, South Alabama visiting two and one App State. The others worth watching briefly. Duke is three and zero, and they're they're a road team against Middle Tennessee State. I think the Blue Devils are going to have a hard time once the ACC schedule gets here. They're just not a very good running team, and they're putting too much pressure on their quarterback Malik Murphy's shoulders. To his credit, the Texas quarterback transfer, Malik Murphy, has delivered under pressure to lead that win in overtime at Northwestern that you and I discussed in great detail this week. It was another impressive comeback against UConn at Wallace Wade Stadium in Durham this past week. So the Devils, like the Tar Heels, legit shot at 4-0 out of the gate, even if all the details aren't pretty. We'll see if Manny Diaz in his rookie season with the Blue Devils, can reach that 4-0 mark as well. And finally, ECU is 2-1, and and they visit an undefeated Liberty team. So this is a great test. Just as App State's visit to Greenville was a litmus test for Mike Houston's team uh, in on its home field, this is maybe just as difficult a road trip because Liberty has built a heck of a program there. The Flames are out to a 3-0 and start. I love the way ECU has been playing defense this season, including against a really talented App State offense in that close loss to the Mountaineers. Pirates just need more from their own offense if they're going to go on the road and beat the Flames on their home field at Liberty. All right, we have more of This Week in College Football with David Glenn, presented by our friends at the North Carolina Port Council. It's coming up in just a moment right here on the North Carolina Sports Network. In sports, we talk a lot about impact players who make a positive difference. When it comes to our state's economy, the North Carolina pork industry is a true MVP. Each year, the pork industry plays an important role in supporting rural communities across our state. It contributes more than $10 billion a year to the North Carolina economy and supports more than 44,000 jobs. Learn more about their positive impact at ncpork.org. The North Carolina Pork Council, the foundational partner of the North Carolina Sports Network. Welcome back to This Week in College Football with Dave Glenn, presented by the North Carolina Port Council here on the North Carolina Sports Network. Okay, DG, time to dive into our ACC and National Week 4 look ahead 
brought to you by our good friends at XL Moving and Storage, a family-owned Allied Vance partner here in North Carolina with 25 years of award-winning experience that can help you with your move to North Carolina, within North Carolina, or away from North Carolina, even internationally, while also assisting with all of your storage needs. Learn more at excelms.com. That's XL Moving and Storage. DG, there are four top 25 versus top 25 matchups on the national schedule this week. One of them involves Tennessee that recently hammered NC State in Charlotte. So before we get into the more intriguing ACC matchups, let's start with the Volunteers, number six in the polls this week, 3-0, and hosting new SEC member Oklahoma, the Sooners, number 15. This game in Norman, 7.30 Saturday night on ABC, the Volunteers opening as a seven-point road favorite. Yeah, as you might guess, ESPN's very popular college day, game day show and crew will be there in Norman for this one, and understandably so. It is by far the highest profile matchup of the entire college football weekend. Both teams are undefeated, as you mentioned. The Volunteers have that exciting young quarterback and have been absolutely annihilating their opponents so far, including the Wolfpack, as you mentioned, in Charlotte. It's Oklahoma's first conference game as a member of the SEC. And oh, by the way, this is a fun wrinkle. Tennessee's head coach, Josh Heupel, is a former Oklahoma star quarterback and was the Heisman Trophy runner-up back in the year 2000 while wearing the Sooners uniform. He will be on the opposite sidelines, of course, while leading the Volunteers. Besides us seeing the Vols in Charlotte two, year, two weeks ago, there's another somewhat local angle to this one that I wanted to mention quickly. The longtime Clemson defensive coordinator, Brent Venables, who was a part of those national championship teams and a lot of other great success with Dabo Sweeney, at Death Valley. Coach Venables is now in year three as the head coach at Oklahoma. He went six and seven in year one, 10 and three last season with a top 25 national finish. Two weeks ago, the Sooners actually struggled at home before beating Houston, while Tennessee, as we've seen, has outscored its three opponents by a score of a wait for it average score of 64 to four. That's probably the reason why the Volunteers are favored by a touchdown in this one, even as the road team. This is probably the must-see TV game of the entire football weekend, but it's certainly that at the college level. All right, let's talk a little ACC football now. 3-1 and one Georgia Tech on the road, a very quiet, undefeated 2-0 and Louisville team. The Cardinals number 19 in the poll this week, 3-30 game on Saturday, ESPN 2 Louisville, a 10-point home favorite over the Yellow Jackets. Yeah, whether you're a Wake fan, a Duke fan, a State fan, or a Carolina fan, I think you have to wonder about how difficult your schedule is going to be once we get to the full-fledged conference play. And I bring up this matchup between Georgia Tech and Louisville in part because whereas we know the Miami Hurricanes are a good-looking football team, I would argue that even though Clemson got whacked by Georgia to start the season – we know that Clemson can be a really good football team and might end up in Charlotte in the ACC title game once again. We, we've seen Georgia Tech enough to know that it's a good football team. Maybe not great. We'll see. We know nothing about the Louisville Cardinals. I mean, they're in the national rankings after a 2-0 and start that has essentially been Cupcake City. The most interesting thing about this one to me is that Louisville has to play a decent football team, maybe even a really good football team in Georgia Tech, because at this point, we have absolutely no idea who the Cardinals are. They did crush both of their first two opponents, but those opponents were the definition of Cupcake City. Austin P and Jacksonville State, who are a combined 0-6 so far this season. Now, we have seen almost every other ACC team against at least one and sometimes more quality opponents, but not Louisville. So even though the Cardinals are nationally ranked at number 19, even though they are undefeated at 2-0, there is no reason in my eyes yet to put them up there on the similar plateau as nationally ranked Miami or nationally ranked Clemson or even a Boston College or anyone else you might want to put up there. If Louisville can beat a pretty solid-looking and well-coached Georgia Tech team just one year after Coach Jeff Brom took the Cardinals to the ACC title game in what was then his first year back at his alma mater, 
that would add one more intriguing contender to the 2024 ACC race, and it would better define what some of our in-state teams have to deal with on their remaining schedules. By the way, we know that Georgia Tech has one of the best dual-threat quarterbacks in the ACC in Haynes King. Louisville thinks that it has its answer at QB in the form of a seventh-year college senior named Tyler Shuck. Shuck spent three seasons at Oregon, then three seasons at Texas Tech, and now this is his first year with the Cardinals. He had only 20 career starts total prior to the season over those six years at other schools, and he compiled a 13-7 and record in those games. He has been injured pretty much everywhere and every time he has been thrust into the starting role. So Louisville's coach, Jeff Brom, who's a former Louisville QB himself, remember, and he's something of a QB whisperer as a coach, he has said that Shuck's former teams asked him to run the ball quite a bit because he's a pretty good athlete, but that contributed to some of his injury problems that kept knocking him out, and that the Cardinals are mostly just going to ask Shuck to stay in the pocket and run a more traditional passing offense as Coach Brom did himself back in the day. He has Ja'Cory Brooks, an Alabama transfer and a former prep All-American, who's off to a great start during his first year now with the Cardinals. A lot of the metrics and the analytics of this one, Chris, like Louisville a lot to win this game. And as you said, the Cardinals are a 10 points favorite. But I see this as a pretty even matchup. I don't even know how you have analytics when the Cardinals have destroyed two completely outmatched opponents or how you take value from those analytics. But we're going to lot, learn a lot more about either or both of these teams when Georgia Tech visits Louisville. And maybe we'll learn about more about the horse race that will result in two teams, of course, playing at Bank of America Stadium in Charlotte for the ACC title. All right, our final game of this segment is just like everybody drew it up in the preseason. New ACC member Cal, 3-0, and the Bears come to Tallahassee to take on 0-3 Florida State. Remember, DG, two of those three losses for the Noles are in ACC play. Florida State a two-point favorite, 7 o'clock Saturday night, ESPN2. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but for me, feels like a must-win game for the Seminoles. Sure. I'll, I'll, it's okay. Put those words in my mouth. Must win it is. There are interesting stories on both sides of this matchup. We have talked quite a bit about FSU's disastrous start on some previous shows. So let me get to the Cal story first this time. Cal coach Justin Wilcox, who's a really smart guy, and he was a fascinating guest on the David Glenn Show back in the preseason. He is in his eighth season as the head coach of the Bears. And I bring that up just because they're new to the ACC and, and most of us around here don't know this story very well. Just for perspective, the only other ACC football coaches who have been with their current teams longer than Justin Wilcox has been with the Cal Bears as their head coach are guys like Dabo Sweeney at Clemson, Dave Dorn at NC State, Dave Clawson at Wake Forest, and Pat Narduzzi at Pitt. And this sounds strange to say for an eighth-year coach, but Justin Wilcox, A, has never finished with more than eight wins in a season. And B, he has never had a winning record in conference play. So the heat was on him coming into this year. And even a 3-0 start doesn't take the heat off entirely. But the Bears are off to their first 3-0 start since 2019. They do have, among those three wins, by the way, a victory at Auburn of the SEC. The Bears are playing maybe the best defense of Coach Wilcox's entire eight-year tenure. And they're off to this excellent start with only minimal contributions with the guy who's probably their best player on the roster, running back Jaden Ott, who has been limited by an ankle injury. Ott's backup running back, Javian Thomas, is averaging about eight yards per carry. He's among the ACC's rushing leaders right now. So that suggests that there's some power to that offensive line, regardless of who is standing behind it. As for the Seminoles, we pointed out last week, that 11 players from their ACC title team of a year ago are on NFL rosters right now. That is an absolutely massive exodus of high-level talent to the professional ranks, and it was unrealistic for anyone to expect that there wasn't going to be a significant adjustment period in the aftermath of that. I'm not saying you should have predicted or expected a crash, but definitely some challenges. Well, now FSU is 0-3 has been absolutely horrendous on the offensive side of the ball. 
where they're averaging only 15 points per game. That is by about 10 points the worst in the Atlantic Coast Conference. Unlike last year when they had Jordan Travis, now on an NFL roster, at the quarterback position. Unlike last year when they had Trey Benson, now in the NFL, at the running back position. Unlike last year, they may not have a wide receiver or tight end star, whereas last year they had Keon Coleman and Johnny Wilson at wide out. They had Jaheim Bell at tight end. Again, all of those guys now playing on Sundays in the NFL. Explaining the team's bad offensive line play may be the biggest head scratcher of all, given the presence of multi-year starters at both tackle positions and center. That group must be better against a Cal team that is playing with great confidence on the defensive side of the ball right now. There is not a person on the planet, as you implied, who would have both picked Cal to start 3-0 or maybe 4-0 and would have picked FSU to start 0-3 or maybe 0-4. We'll see this weekend. I don't think that'll happen, but the burden is on Florida State's defense to create some turnovers. The burden is on Florida State's offensive line to create some holes for the Seminoles running backs and some time for DJ Uyangalale. Only those things are going to prevent what would be a new and unimaginable level of disaster in Tallahassee. All right, we're up against another timeout. We'll take one here. We'll come back and have more of This Week in College Football with David Glenn, presented by the North Carolina Port Council, right here on the North Carolina Sports Network. I am a better person and a more effective business owner for having known and learned from Emily Parks over many years now. Emily's company, Organize for Success, helps multi-passionate business owners and executives bring harmony to all the layers of their lives, from work to side projects, from friends and family to hobbies, community, and beyond. With Emily's help, you too can make every minute matter. She helps you determine what earns your time and how to efficiently accomplish what matters. One of the many things I love about Emily is that she does not impose her will on her clients. She listens to them. That way she can better help them cultivate the lives they want to live. You can set up a complimentary call with Emily today by visiting organizeforsuccess.com. One of my favorite restaurants in Raleigh for many years now has been The Oak, Scratch Kitchen and Bourbon Bar. It's located on Lake Boone Trail, which is a perfect location for a great meal and beverage if you're on your way to nearby Carter-Finley Stadium or perhaps PNC Arena for a concert, Wolfpack or Hurricanes game, or other event. The menu is incredibly tasty and creative. The atmosphere is a lot of fun. The bourbon options are as high-end and varied as you'll find anywhere. The staff is super classy and first-rate, and I've just always loved the people, the food, and the overall vibe there. When I took Carolina Hurricanes owner Tom Dundon to lunch, yes, meaning the billionaire who owns the hockey team, I took him to the Oak. Seriously, it's that good. Learn more or make a reservation by visiting their website, theoakraleigh.com. That's theoakraleigh.com. Welcome back to This Week in College Football with David Glenn, presented by the North Carolina Port Council, right here on the North Carolina Sports Network. DG, time for our coaches and quarterback segment, brought to you by our good friends at Lawson Insurance who are about to celebrate their 50th anniversary of helping DG and many other North Carolina citizens and businesses with their personal and commercial insurance needs. You can reach out to the brothers Ken Miller and Michael Lawson, just like us. They're all huge sports fans. Give them a call, 919-846-2090, or search Lawson Insurance online. Okay, DG, now NC State and North Carolina both have had an unusual amount of quarterback turmoil so far throughout the course of the opening three weeks of the season. I'm curious, who has the better chance of finding a good answer this season on the field, the Wolfpack or the Tar Heels at the quarterback position, and why do you think it's that team? Well, it's funny that the Lawson Insurance folks sponsor this segment, Chris, because all three of those brothers, let's just say that a portion of that trio roots for the Wolfpack, and a portion roots for the Tar Heels. So your your question and perhaps this answer are very relevant to that particular insurance office. Uh, my answer as to who has 
more promise at that most important position on the field? Short answer, NC State. True freshman C.J. Bailey and maybe the return of the fifth-year senior Grayson McCall at least offer promise in Raleigh. I can't predict what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen, but I like the potential more than I do in Chapel Hill. At UNC, Jacoby Criswell is in his fifth year of college football, and Connor Harrell is in his third year of college football, and neither has ever shown anything to suggest that he is capable of being an above-average quarterback by ACC standards. Harrell has that deer-in-the-headlights look that we described on previous shows on many passing plays if he has to go to more than one progression. And Chriswell, while he did have his moments against NC Central last week, as we mentioned earlier, he has never started and won a game against an FBS opponent at the college level. That'll be his challenge, of course, if he starts against JMU this week. In the case of Grayson McCall at NC State, he does have a long and large body of work that includes three-time Sunbelt Player of the Year, that includes 10,000-plus career passing yards at the FBS level, that includes a 34-9 and career record as a starting quarterback at the FBS level. That's a lot of victories. That's a lot of experience. Two things the Carolina guys just don't have. Dave Doran described Grayson McCall's status as day-to-day Uh, late last week or over the weekend. So we don't know how long he's going to be unavailable. C.J. Bailey offers promise, again, under brutally difficult circumstances at Clemson this week. But you asked the question in the long run this season, and those are the reasons that the promise of C.J. Bailey and the body of work of Grayson McCall, to me, offer more promise than anything we've seen from those second and third string quarterbacks at Carolina now that Max Johnson is out of the picture for the rest of the season. All right, now on the flip side, there are seven ACC teams that remain unbeaten at this early stage in the season. Cal, Duke, Louisville, Miami, North Carolina, Pitt, and Syracuse are all undefeated. Now of those seven teams, which ACC head coach do you believe might deserve the most credit for what they've done behind the scenes to get their team off to a good start. Yeah, I'd like to start by saying I think all seven deserve credit, but for a wide variety of reasons. And let me say that I would put both Manny Diaz of Duke and Mac Brown of Carolina somewhere on the medal stand because it is not easy to start 3-0 when your opponents know most of your obvious weaknesses. Duke isn't great on the offensive line this year. Duke's having trouble running the ball, but the Devils are 3-0 with a chance, a good one, to get to 4-0. Carolina has been in complete chaos at quarterback and has an almost brand new offensive line. But thanks to defense, plus special teams, plus running back Omarion Hampton, who once again is ranked among the nation's top five leading rushers, the Tar Heels are 3-0 and with a very good chance to get to 4-0 and this week. I do not take such things for granted under difficult circumstances, even if I think the Devils and the Heels, and I do, are going to have some serious struggles once the ACC schedule rolls around. My gold medal winner, with all that said, in this category so far, it's still early as you said, is Pitt head coach Pat Narduzzi. The Panthers were a flat-out bad football team last season. Their 3-9 and nine record was the worst of Narduzzi's entire time there, and he's been there for close to a decade at this point. And after the season, they lost quite a bit of talent to the transfer portal. Duke and Pitt maybe lost more than any other ACC teams on the outbound in the transfer portal 2023 style. But Narduzzi made some really difficult decisions. One, he hired a new offensive coordinator. That's Western Carolina's own Cade Bell, son of the Catamounts head coach Derwin Bell, our guest on the David Glenn Show. Uh, Excuse me, Kerwin Bell. And and the other difficult decision was going with a redshirt freshman quarterback. He chose... Alabama transfer Eli Holstein as his starting quarterback over a veteran, Nate Yarnell, who had been with the Panthers for several years. Those decisions, along with some really high effort performances by the entire Panthers team, have paid off with this 3-0 start that, remember, included two challenging opponents in Power 4 Cincinnati and Power 4 West Virginia. The Panthers actually trailed the Bearcats 27-6 on the road, 
You know what your winning percentage is under those circumstances? Not good. It ain't high. You got it, brother. It, and, and by the way, it was 27 to 6 on the road in the second half. And the Panthers came back to win that game 28 to 7. Uh, 28 to 27, excuse me. That is one of the most impressive wins by any ACC team in this entire season so far. Then at home, the Panthers trailed the West Virginia Mountaineers 34-24 in the fourth quarter. Again, winning percentage, not great historically. Panthers came back to win that one 38-34 with Eli Holstein being among the stars. Those two comeback victories in those sorts of extreme difficult circumstances, both again against power four opponents, a lot of these pretty 2-0 and or 3-0 and records come at the expense of some cupcakes, at least one or more. They have made the details of the Panthers 3-0 and start that much more impressive. The heart behind two of those victories were was just incredibly impressive to me. When all appeared lost, Pat Narduzzi's guys kept fighting against quality opponents. And again, one of those two was on the road. Quick PS on this one. One of the best newcomers in the entire Atlantic Coast Conference is Western Carolina transfer running back Desmond Reed of the Panthers. Cade Bell knew he needed dudes, right? So he got one of his guys from Western to follow him to pit. Desmond Reed is now the number one running back for the Panthers. He was great for the Catamounts, remember? And Kerwin Bell, he's been great in the Atlantic Coast Conference. Some wonder, can you make the jump from FCS to ACC? Desmond Reed has done it in style. Right now, the two leading rushers in the ACC are the All-American, Omarion Hampton at UNC, and yes, former Western Carolina star Desmond Reed, now of the Pitt Panthers. They're the only two, by the way, averaging more than 100 rushing yards per game at least for now, in the ACC. Desmond Reed also leads all ACC running backs in receiving. He has 13 catches for 167 yards and three touchdowns as a receiver so far this season. So Cade Bell is obviously get, is getting Desmond Reed involved in every conceivable way. Who'd have thought that the Western Carolina Catamounts would have so much influence on the ACC race this year? and certainly on Pitt's impressive 3-0 and start this season under Pat Narduzzi. Obviously, North Carolina, the epicenter of the ACC <laughs> in all aspects, right, DG? We've got, got one more time out to burn. We'll come back and have more of This Week in College Football with David Glenn, presented by the North Carolina Port Council in just a moment, right here on the North Carolina Sports Network. Michael Berard, Managing Director Investments with the Founders Group at Stiefel, works with a select group of high net worth individuals and institutions to develop and implement investment plans tailored to their specific objectives and risk tolerances. If you are interested in highly personalized, well-researched guidance and outstanding personal service, you can contact Michael at 984-364-2002. That's 984-364-2002. Stiefel Nicholas and Company Incorporated, member SIPC and NYSE. The original Salt Works has become a legendary breakfast, brunch, and lunch place in Wilmington for both locals and out-of-town visitors over the last 50-plus years. Our good friend Bob Hubbard owns the place, but he's also the one cooking your food and often roaming the dining room to greet you with a smile and to make sure your visit is a great one. Bob has been running the show at this unique roadside diner for more than 20 years now, and he and his friendly, hardworking staff aim to treat you like one of their own. Try Bob's homemade omelets or special recipe grits for breakfast or his legendary cheeseburgers for lunch. The Original Salt Works, your breakfast and lunch choice on Oleander Drive in Wilmington. Welcome back to This Week in College Football with David Glenn, presented by the North Carolina Port Council. Now, while our focus of the show is going to mostly be forward-looking as often as possible, we're also going to take a chance to look back at the previous week in college football, in part because DG tends to find the intriguing angles and has some unique observations or historical perspective that you can't find anywhere else. So, DG, with that thought in mind, we bring you our quick glance back to week three Brought to you by our good friends at Jimmy's Bar and King Neptune Restaurant in Wrightsville Beach. Jimmy's has a full bar, 
nightly drink specials, live music 365 days a year. And right next door, you'll find King Neptune. It's become one of the best restaurants on the entire greater Wilmington area. You can keep up with Jimmy's on Facebook and learn more about King Neptune Restaurant at NeptunesWB.com. Week three, some intriguing developments beyond those that we've already talked about, DG. And one of those happened in Greenville, where App State edged East Carolina 21-19. to Mountaineers now 3-0 and all-time head-to-head against the Pirates since they started playing each other as FBFs programs. So with that thought in mind, did you see more good news for the Mountaineers or more bad news for the Pirates? Yeah, definitely more good news for the Mountaineers. I thought the Pirates played a good football game. They're continuing to make baby steps offensively at ECU, which was desperately needed for Mike Houston's club, given the struggles on that side of the ball a year ago. They just didn't have enough offensively against a well-coached App State defense. So my answer, bottom line, is that App State showed more good things and promise than ECU showed bad things. I still think the Pirates are going to have a much better record in the end than last year's 2-10 and 10 debacle. What I saw at App State was exactly what we predicted on this show one week ago. We thought it would be a close game, and we thought when push came to shove, the accomplished quarterback, fewer mistakes, more experience, of Joey Aguilar for App State was probably going to make the difference. And it was. On that game-winning touchdown drive, he made a huge, huge throw. Uh, that one to, was to Makai Jackson for, I think, a 36-yard mm-hmm. touchdown that ended up sealing the fate in this game. When you have a proven quarterback in Joey Aguilar, a couple of reliable running backs, actually the Pirates were so strong on the front seven that they made it hard for the Mountaineers to run the ball. But I would want Anderson Castle and Kanye Roberts as my one-two punch in the backfield as Sean Clark has at App State. The receiving core has Caden Robinson and Christian Horn and Makai Jackson and Eli Wilson. I think it was our own Mike Waddell who had a great video of Eli Wilson's touchdown catch in that game, which of course was another key play in a relatively low scoring matchup. 21-19 21-19 App State. It was Makai Jackson, the receiver, with one long touchdown reception. It was Eli Wilson with the other touchdown reception from Joey Aguilar. The line isn't as dominant as many App State lines have been in the past. Sean Clark, a guy who loves his offensive line play, probably wants to see that get better. I don't think the Mountaineers are as great defensively as some of their other teams have been, uh, even under Sean Clark. But now that they're hitting the Sun Belt, schedule. Maybe those areas will improve while a lot of those other pieces are already in place. I Heading into the season, I understood why the Sun Belt media made the Mountaineers one of the favorites to win that league or at least play in that league's title game again. Uh, and I think after the Mountaineers 2-1 and one start with the only loss being to a very talented Clemson team at Death Valley, I haven't seen anything bad to change my mind about that high and promising forecast for App State. Uh, but but I'm glad you asked the question that way because there was no alarm bells for the ECU Pirates in lo- losing to a quality, talented, well-coached App State team in Greenville. We'll see if the Pirates can pick up the pieces uh, during their trip to Liberty. But I really like how App State bounced back from the Clemson debacle and took a step forward at ECU as the Mountaineers enter Sunbelt play. Now, as you know, on our show and across the North Carolina Sports Network, we celebrate all things college football in North Carolina, not just our FBS programs, not just our power conference teams, all of the great things going on here in the old North State. So with that thought in mind, among the in-state teams and players, and it can be at any level of football, who else did you see as deserving of a shout out for their performance last week? Yeah, there's a bunch of them. I mean, shout out to Malik Murphy of Duke for leading another comeback victory. Shout out to Jacoby Criswell, who remember was a Tar Heel, transferred to Arkansas where he was stuck behind other talented players. You know, as a Tar Heel, he was stuck behind guys like Sam Howell and Drake May. Nothing to be ashamed of there. Didn't play much at Arkansas and, and transferred at the last minute back to Carolina where he probably expected to be a little used third stringer who would qualify only as the break glass in case of emergency guy. Well, guess what? Mac Brown had to break the glass with Max Johnson out and with Connor Harrell struggling, Jacoby Criswell, for those who didn't see it, stepped in in a scary game against NC Central and led those first half and second half drives 
to prevent what would have been a disastrous home loss for the Tar Heels. Beyond those guys, uh, I want to give a quick shout out to both Lenore Ryan and Wingate at the two, the Division II level. Lenore Ryan, remember, played in the D2 National Championship game a year ago and lost their coach to Mercer of the FCS. They Under a new coach, they've started well, and they're number six in one of the polls. So they certainly have not dropped the ball, so to speak, after a coaching change. And oh, by the way, Wingate posted a win over a top 25 opponent last week, and Wingate debuts in this week's top 25. So I'm always excited. We don't often have teams in North Carolina that are in the Division Three top 25. We, of course, have seen both North Carolina A&T and NC Central win the HBCU National Championship as FCS opponents, uh, or as FCS programs, rather, in our backyard, who happen to be opponents this Saturday as we bring the Old North State tailgate to O'Kelly Riddick Stadium in Durham on Saturday night. Again, come to see us from 5 to 7 p.m. leading up to that kickoff. We do try to celebrate the best of what we see at every level, D3, D2, FCS, and of course the seven FBS programs here in our state. But those were some of those higher profile programs with lower profile players who made an impact, but also two D2 programs that deserve a lot of credit for getting into the national rankings. Now, of course, we'll follow and see how long they can stay there because you remember last year, Chris, you and I had Kerwin Bell of Western Carolina as a guest on uh, our various programs in part because he was putting together one of the best seasons in recent memory for the Catamounts football program, period, and spent a lot of time in the national top 25 where Western has not spent much time over the years. Uh, in this case, we'll see. Either Lenore Ryan is going to keep up what has been a fascinating football tradition right here in our backyard, win get more of a newcomer to the top 25, but I'm glad we got a chance to give those two a brief shout out at the D2 level. And again, if they keep winning, we'll keep following and you'll even see their coaches on our show as well. All right, DG, we're out of time. Thanks to everybody for joining us. A huge thank you to the North Carolina Port Council for being the founding partner of the North Carolina Sports Network. And we welcome Atlantic Tire and Service now with six locations in the triangle as our newest sponsor. A quick reminder, DG and his staff post daily articles at our fast-growing website, ncsportsnetwork.com, which also has direct links on the homepage to this YouTube channel, the wide variety of places you can get on-demand audio and podcasts of our show, The David Glenn Show, and all of our other offerings, and updates on year two of our old North State tailgate and traveling sports circus, which will be at North Carolina Central in Durham this Saturday and at Appalachian State in Boone on the final Saturday of September. For David Glenn, I'm Chris Edwards. Thanks again for joining us on This Week in College Football with David Glenn right here on the North Carolina Sports Network.